So I'd like to welcome, uh, welcome you all to this session. It's another COIL conversation. Uh, we try to bring in leaders, thought leaders from across the country, talk with them, learn from them. We really appreciate people's willingness to help us think about all the ways we might be changing and what we might be considering here at Penn State. Our guest today is Aaron Brower. Aaron is the Interim Provost and Vice Chancellor at University of Wisconsin Extension, a Special Assistant to the UW System President uh, for New Educational Strategies. He formerly served as Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning at U UW Madison, where he had previously served as a professor in the School of Social Work, Integrated Liberal Studies, and Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis. And we've asked Aaron to, to uh, join us today because of a, 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 an amazing, in my opinion, innovative uh, way to provide higher education to uh, our, one of our, or several of our populations that we try to serve. So I won't uh, steal his, uh, his uh, highlights by telling you about it. I'm going to let him do that. So I'm going to drop my camera. We're going to let Aaron open it up by telling us about UW's flex options. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. So take it away, Aaron. Great. Thank you, Kyle, and thanks for the uh, invitation to talk with you all. So, um, so by way of introduction, um, Kyle mentioned a, a bit of my background and my position just before being interim provost here was vice provost of teaching and learning, and uh, in that capacity, essentially, just so you kind of can place me in your structure, uh, Rob Pangborn was, the, was my counterpart at Penn State. Um, and uh, then Rob got uh, kicked upstairs, so to speak, in the midst of all of your uh, transition. Um, so I haven't seen him in a while, but uh, he was a really good guy. Um, okay, so actually even before that, let me tell you a little bit about um, how I got here, and then I'll tell you about uh, Flex. And Kyle had sent me a few questions to just get us started, and what I would like to do is try and get through any talking I'm going to do in the first, let's just say, 15, 20 minutes so we can open this up for discussion. Um, my background as a professor, I've been a professor at Madison for uh, 27 years in social work and higher ed. Um, my primary areas of research were on um, student transition to college, uh, how different students make the transition to college, um, college success, and learning outcomes. And in particular, this um, idea that you can structure learning environments to maximize student success, and you structure learning environments by uh, being intentional about both in and out of class activities. So um, if you're familiar with uh, the George Koo work on um, high impact practices, um, it's, um, that's the, um, the language that people talk about now, but that's essentially the idea. So things like freshman seminars and undergraduate research, uh, uh, um, learning communities, both residential and curricular based, uh, capstone experiences, internships, that sort of thing. Um, when I was vice provost, I could do that, I, I then worked with uh, our university, and, and actually I did a consulting gig with Penn State um, on a residential learning community um, to try and broaden this idea and promote those programs across the campus. Um, and then when um, the uh, president of the UW system and uh, the governor of the state of Wisconsin announced this flexible degree option, they asked me last year if I could um, help lead that up, and I really jumped at the chance. It's a very exciting um, development in higher ed, and, uh, and again, just I was really happy to, to, to do that. Okay, so some of the antecedents of, of the FLEX degree. So uh, we all know that funding um, for higher education has been declining uh, since the late 70s, early 80s. Um, the uh, decline itself has been more or less uh, rapid in different states, um, but we're all, in a sense, ending at the same place, which is the uh, fraction of, the, um, of our budgets that come from states has just declined radically over the past 
30, 40 years. Um, and as a consequence, you know, how do universities then uh, manage the, uh, their, uh, their resources? And in addition, um, how to do this without simply putting it on the backs of, uh, of tuition. And again, different campuses and different states are dealing with this issue in different ways. But sort of the financial pressure is one driver in um, change in higher ed. A second driver is um, the increased demand for higher education. And this is really an issue, I think, um, about how there's a changing demographic of who's coming to college. Uh, I suspect you know this statistic because of the populations you work with, but um, nationally, only 15% of, uh, of students who go to college now are um, what we might have called traditional college students. Um, 18 to 22 year olds who live on campus or live in uh, apartments around campus. Um, Eight, eight, uh, so that's 15%. So 85% are different from that. Either part-time, older students um, uh, stop in and stop out, come in for a, we've been calling them locally, kind of pre uh, or sub-baccalaureate uh, certificates. Um, but they're not in the standard residential uh, full-time program. So, and, and their needs for college then are really different. Um, you know, do we need a four-year degree in computer science or is it a certificate in mobile apps or some other language? So um, that's, that's the second driver. The third driver is technology. And, uh, you know, I kind of colloquial, colloquially call this the Google world transition. And, you know, students now have essentially the same information that we do. Uh, so as a professor, my job is no longer about providing access to education. It's really about um, how to help students use that in information, how to apply it in new settings, how to develop new knowledge, uh, um, and things like that. And, and, and in particular, in the last maybe four or five years, the technologies themselves have gotten so uh, advanced that um, that we actually can live up to the promise of having uh, educational systems that are rich and, and engaging and, um, and um, you know, really conducive to a kind of learning environment that we need. Um, and, and also open access and easy access. By the way, the, the, the kind of access to high speed uh, internet, uh, not just Wi-Fi, but even just, um, you know, landline, uh, I mean, buried cable lines is still an issue. And, and in the state of Wisconsin, I'm sure it's true in Pennsylvania, uh, there are areas that really are not served well by broadband. And, um, you know, we kind of forget that. Anyway, but that's that's the, the, the last driver. Um, and then there's a political piece that's unique to Wisconsin that um, I don't want to spend a lot of time on, but I'm happy to actually uh, talk about this if you want to in questions. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to, I don't want to try and be uh, kind of cute about this. It's, it's uh, clearly been a, a factor as we've been developing UW Flex. Um, but it's not the predominant factor um, uh, among the others that I've, I've described for you. But the political issue here is um, uh, our governor, uh, uh, Governor Walker, is um, uh, sees himself as wanting to be on a national stage, and so he's been looking for an, uh, an opportunity to provide a, a kind of platform for himself um, more broadly. And, um, you know, the main one has to do with job creation, but a portion of that has to do with uh, training employees to meet current job needs. And um, he has looked to the um, UW system as a partner, to be a partner in that process. Our system is different from yours. Um, you may or may not know this, but Penn State works as, I, this is probably not exactly accurate, but kind of like one campus with lots of uh, regional uh, campuses. And so you get, you get admitted into um, Penn State, and then uh, 
my understanding is kind of assigned to either the College Park campus or um, or others. On in the Wisconsin system, there are thirteen uh, separate universities. So UW Milwaukee, UW Madison, uh, UW Stout, UW Green Bay, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And their autonomous campuses, separate admissions processes, separate degrees. Um, there is a, a board that oversees all of them, but um, but it's not the same as kind of um, one board for a unified uh, campus with multiple sites. And that's important in the way in which we've developed uh, UW Prep. Uh, let's see, I forgot where I was headed with that description. Um, oh, uh, the governor's um, goals. So, so the governor says, you know, we really want to have some kind of better, more accessible uh, um, educational opportunities for students, and particularly for students that are adult, uh, returning adults who have some college and, and, and not a degree, or have a degree in one area and they need to refocus uh, for a job transition or uh, professional development or job training. And by the way, I was at, this is him talking about it two years ago, I was at a, uh, a meeting of governors who started talking about Western Governors University, and, um, and uh, some of them are talking about bringing Western Governors in uh, as part of the university, um, as part of what the state would support for another um, um, higher education choice. And you saw that happen in Texas and uh, Indiana, and I think now Washington State has got a Western Governors um, uh, specialization there. They call it Western Governors Texas or Western Governors Indiana. So our system said, well, we could do better. <laughs> and I could tell you about Western Governors if you're interested in hearing about details there. but. They do some things really pretty well, and they, they take compromises in other ways in order to do the kind of program that they want. Um, in our case, what we decided we wanted to do was um, offer the standard degrees that each of our campuses would offer. Uh, so uh, in other words, the nursing, the Bachelor's of Nursing program at UW-Milwaukee is the actual degree that students will get in a flexible format. So our program takes existing degrees and existing certificates and, and uses the same faculty for oversight, the same faculty governance and shared governance for academic planning processes, um, and uh, the same faculty who will be grading the students and evaluating the students, et cetera. And then the campus confers that um, degree on the students as they go through in, in this flexible route. And the, the basic way uh, UW Flex works is that, um, you know, again, let's take the nursing program at Milwaukee. The College of Nursing for their standard residential program, and they also have an online version, but for either one, you lay out the, the uh, learning outcome um, and array them at, all the way from um, medical terminology, content areas, um, to patient care variables. Uh, everything that is important for that nurse, bachelor's level nurse, to know and um, and know how to what to do. Um, so those are arrayed, and then uh, typically in the standard course, the uh, standard curriculum, those outcomes are organized into classes, and then students take the classes and proceed to the degree by taking classes. In UW Flex, and this is um, I'm describing for you competency-based education. Um, instead of having those outcomes organized in classes, the outcomes, each outcome has attached with it an assessment uh, that demonstrates that the student has actually mastered that um, either knowledge base or skill set. And you progress to your degree by completing assessment uh, one after another until you get to the degree. Um, Again, picture the nurse uh, nursing program, arrays all these outcomes, um, and um, this is aimed at um, 
primarily at nurses who are um, currently RNs, and so they're in a two-year, you know, they have an associate's degree RN, and they're wanting to complete that to get to the bachelor's. It may be that this nurse has been working in, in a hospital for 10 years, and they know medical terminology cold, right? They've been using it forever. And uh, so why make them sit through a course, give them the assessment, which in that case is, is a basically a multiple choice test and they have to score above what the nursing faculty consider a mastery threshold, which in this case is about 86%. Um, they could do that, knock it off, and then move on to the next thing. There may be elements of patient care that they actually can do quite well and the assessment there is actually clinical, inter, um, clinical oversight. So we'll send a nurse uh, one of the nursing faculty to the hospital setting that the student is in and oversee the student engaging in the skill set that is uh, being evaluated. Again, there's a rubric for uh, developing mastery there and, uh, I mean, demonstrating mastery and um, if a student completes it, great. If they don't, they keep working at it. Um, and so you can see how a student can um, pace this according to what they know and the background they're coming in with and focus on those things that they need to focus on and kind of get credit for those things that they already know. It's not prior learning assessment in the sense that um, uh, um, you get credit for simply being a nurse. It's, it's you get credit if you demonstrate what you already know and you're not going to make them take a, a set course or curriculum. If you don't need it. So, uh, so we opened officially um, Monday for enrollment, and um, we've got five programs right now. If you want to look at our website, it's flex.wisconsin.edu. Um, there's a bachelor's of uh, of nursing at Milwaukee, a bachelor's of information studies at Milwaukee, which is kind of like the uh, new version of the library science degree, which is kind of like a computer science, web design, uh, information science degree. Um, a bachelor's in uh, diagnostic imaging and a certificate in business and professional communication. Those are all at UW-Milwaukee. And then we have an associate's degree in arts and sciences from UW colleges, which is our two-year um, gen ed campuses. And the, the intent of that associate's degree is to provide the general education requirements so that students could then transfer uh, either to a standard brick and mortar course or uh, a finishing flex degree. Um, Kyle asked me questions about two other questions that I'll try and get to and, um, and then let me stop and we can, uh, we can talk a bit. So one has to do with um, uh, well, actually three things. One has to do with are there other programs planned and the answer is yes and I'm in discussion with um, four other institutions around the UW system about new certificates and degrees that they're going to offer and now that we've got sort of the first group um, working its way through and we're starting to admit students and we'll start working with them uh, in January, it's easier for new institutions to come in as you can imagine you know, the early adopters are kind of helping us work out the bugs and then uh, we'll grow this program. This is an entirely uh, billed as a cost recovery program. So it's priced in a way so that tuition will cover all costs and, um, and uh, the programs are going to be viable because they generate enough income based on um, tuition uh, so that um, they become self-supporting. So they're intentionally not requiring state funds or other subsidies from the state. We do need a, um, a ramp up period. It'll, we, we estimate in our business plan that it's going to be three to five years before we break even. So we have new money on the table from the system uh, to help with the development costs. But again, once we hit that break even, then, they can, then the programs are self-sufficient and so we have requirements about enrollments and costs uh, and stuff like that. But we'll be growing the number of programs. And I would guess that ultimately we'll probably have maybe 10 to 15 uh, certificates.
certificates and, and degrees, and that's kind of the, the ceiling that we'll hit. Another question Kyle had was, um, was the uh, response to date from both students and faculty um, and generally. So the, the short answer on that is generally um, the responses have been very, very positive from um, students, from um, business leaders, from the legislature, so the politics about this, and, um, and also from uh, faculty um, by and large, but not entirely. And as you could imagine, and I'm sure you find this same, um, the same thing with your program, um, you know, faculty are on a bell curve like every other segment of the population. And so on that bell curve, um, on one side of it are the faculty working with us right now who really jumped into this. They felt like, uh, actually the nurses, the moment I, I had my first presentation to say, here's what we're planning, and it really wasn't even a very well-developed um, idea at that point, I got a call the next day from the dean of the, of the nursing school at Milwaukee saying, we're, we'd like to do this. We've been looking for something and we don't have the capacity to manage the demand on our time and we've got a lot of online material already and you know the sort of modular way you're thinking about this and uh, stackable certificates or stackable uh, competencies, you know, we're all over this. So they're, you know, so they're like on one end of this bell curve. And on the other end of the bell curve, I would give uh, talks to faculty senates at the various campuses. And one faculty senate um, issued a resolution that said, we don't know what UW Flex is, but whatever it is, we're against it. And so I said, okay, you know, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. It's, uh, you know, it's built to be, again, self-sustaining. So it's not ideally going to compete for resources. Uh, ultimately from other programs. Um, that was actually an important condition before I accepted the position. Um, so, so anyway, you get the whole spread. And, um, and uh, again, I probably don't have to make this case very hard, but um, the idea of, of students learning, it's, you know, it, it's really a student-centered approach where students are expected to learn um, the responsibility for learning is on them rather than sitting in a course and just, uh, you know, granted, being granted credits because you sat through uh, the right number of um, classroom hours. Um, that makes sense to most people. Um, I, I also will say this approach works better for some kinds of students um, and not others. The students who we are um, expecting Will, this will be hardest for are ones that really need more structure and uh, need more of a cohort model to uh, help them um, stay focused and motivated. And the students where it's going to work really well for are the ones that are self-motivated and their life is structured in a way so they can dedicate a spot in their house to do uh, the work they need to do and that kind of thing. And it also is going to work better in some fields than others. Professional fields, nursing, IT, are easier. I don't think it's impossible to do it in history or uh, philosophy or, you know, psychology, but, um, but it's harder to um, make as concrete the learning outcome um, that you would need to in order for this model. Let's see. Um, you also had a question about how the flex fit, so the way in which we're enrolling students, um, how that works. But maybe before I answer that, let me just say one more last uh, kind of overall thing, and then let's open it up and I'm happy to answer whatever questions you got. Um, so uh, the, the last thing I want to say is that when we move away from a credit and course-based curriculum, it changes everything about the way uh, the program works. So the education, of course, is different, and the role that faculty are playing is different. But it also changes the way the um, advising functions for the, for the program. We really need to provide very hands-on, integrated, proactive advising uh, 
Uh, we're calling it academic success coaches. We're hiring full-time professionals um, who are overseen by the faculty in the department who are providing a, a kind of a, amalgam of traditional academic advising plus some low-level uh, tutoring plus some mentoring plus some um, life coaching, you know, um, time management skills and things. Um, but you can you could picture a student who's faced with just a series of doing assessments getting really lost in that model unless they're provided with clear guidance about you know first do this one then do that one um, and when you get stuck here's I'm going to refer you over to a, you know a faculty member who's a content expert or I'm going to refer you refer you to the financial aid office or whatever so advising changes but then all these other operational functions change. Uh, transcripts look different, so registrar functions are different. Um, the way we admit students into the program is different. The um, kind of uh, the way financial aid is administered is different. Um, just to give you a, a flavor of this, uh, births are functioning are different. So right now, students register for courses, and courses are based on numbers of credits, and then you can calculate the cost of that course based on the credits. In a self-paced, competency-based model, students are instead registering for time. So we've got a three-month subscription period, 2250, and we kind of informally call it the all-you-can-learn uh, model. So you can do as many competencies as you can work through, and we give you as much support as you need um, in that three-month period. But, but when you think about the uh, literally the um, computer uh, system that registers students now, it bases everything on credits and, and, and price and uh, time and the transcripts and everything is tied to credits. So when you take out credits and you're now just looking at time, how do you, you, you need to set up a whole new system from scratch. So that's sort of the point I'm getting at is everything changed. We, we now have have had to build new transcription, new bursaring, new student information system records, um, you know, from, from front to back. Okay, I said I was going to talk for 20 minutes, and now I talked for 30 minutes, so let me stop there and uh, see what kind of questions we have. Okay, who wants to uh, open the questions? Feel free to pop your camera on if you have one, to uh, raise a hand or to type a question into the chat box. I see uh, Douglas Anthony Wilson is typing a question in. Let's start, with, let's start with one coming through the chat box here. Okay, student coaches. In here we go. Okay, Chris Gamrat called next. Chris, while while Doug's typing, why don't you pop up your mic and go ahead and and ask your question? Sure. So, hi, uh, Chris Gamrat, instructional designer in the College of uh, Information Sciences and Technology. Um, question for you is: Could you talk a little bit about how uh, the components of these programs were designed to be? Uh, would you describe as stackable? Yeah. Uh, so first of all, if I'm going to guess based on the name of your college of uh, information science and technology, that's the same college that's offering our bachelors of information studies and technology. Um, so you're probably familiar with that. Uh, so the idea of um, of the stackable uh, credentials is. is um, um, I'll tell you about a new program that we're going to announce uh, that's coming from UW Parkside. Um, it's sort of a business-oriented set of certificates, six of them, that the students will pick. If it's And a student picks three, and that will equal a bachelor's in, right now it's called bachelor's in general studies, but I think it'll ultimately be, ultimately be called bachelor's in management science or some again, business-related domain. So they're creating six certificates, one in project management, one in um, global studies, 
one in sales, one in leadership, one in professional writing, and one in human relations. Um, and those certificates are composed of, instead of regular courses, let's just say in the leadership one, um, it's a set of competencies, a set of outcomes. How to run a meeting, and I'm making this up because they haven't specified yet. How to run a meeting, how to uh, organize an agenda, uh, how to uh, kind of learning about interpersonal skills, uh, both verbal and nonverbal, uh, maybe group development variables, um, you know, and let's say there are eight or ten of those. A student could take just that certificate, complete that, get that credential, uh, and, and, and actually and get that credential transcripted. And then they could join it with, uh, let's say, leadership, uh, interpersonal, uh, sorry, international skills, global skills, and professional writing. And that may be, and then you've got someone who's kind of looking for an international uh, relations related company where they want to do something uh, kind of in, uh, you know, with, with technical writing. Someone else might do management, sales, and um, project management, sorry, human relations, sales, and project management. And, and again, you get a different flavor for how that uh, particular degree would um, stack up. Um, so that's the idea. You're, the opportunity of having um, a curriculum based on discrete competencies or sets of competencies is that you can kind of like mix and match them, almost like Lego blocks, to, um, to create the uh, stackable credential that you're looking for. Great. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Chris, for the question. We have uh, Doug Wilson asked the question. He, he started talking about student coaches. He wants to know, how did they come to be included in the design? In other words, what was your thinking? How did that sort of evolve as an important part? Well. Um, we did a visit out to Western Governors, actually, about a year, uh, year ago, uh, myself and a couple of the other uh, leaders in, the, in our program. And we were asking them how it was working and what some of the issues were. And of course, they're giving you the best of all views. Um, and then we did a little digging in their, uh, in their um, kind of the user uh, reviews of their program. And the biggest complaint had to do with the advising that was provided, and Western Governors actually does a quite nice job of a lot of the basics related to this sort of advising and support model. Um, so uh, they, all, they assign one advisor to a student uh, at the point of admissions, and that advisor follows the student through till they graduate, and they call it a student mentor. It's a professional person, but student mentor. As distinct from a course mentor, their program is course-based, um, not only competency-based. The course mentor is kind of like a uh, tutor who has content knowledge in a specific course. So student mentor is this advisor role. And this person is, is explicitly not um, academically oriented. It's more a traditional advisor role, although they do have the proactive um, advising component. Anyway, so they kind of explained that whole thing, and, and it seemed very important, again, like I was describing before, about getting, um, getting lost without clear guidance about um, uh, aspects of how to succeed in the program. So when we started talking about it, we thought, why do we want to separate out academics from everything else? Why, if we can do it, can we find people and build a role that will be explicitly integrative across all domains that's, that are important to students. And, um, and that's sort of the genesis of it. And then as we began working with that, we, we got to other details. For example, um, the cost of these people, these are going to have to be very high, highly trained uh, professionals who, um, uh, because uh, a lot of the success of the student really depends on the quality of this, these academic success coaches. So we're paying them uh, uh, 50 to 55,000 full time, and the ratio of, um, of success coach to students is 1 to 85, which is uh, different 
by a lot than the standard academic advising model. Nationally, that ratio is about one to 300 in a um, reactive uh, advising model rather than proactive. Anyway, so that's a bit more about how those, how those positions came about. We have hired right now um, uh, a director of student success, which is uh, overseeing the academic success coach program. And we've hired a project leader in the academic success uh, area, plus two academic success coaches. So those three are our first set of academic success coaches for our first hundred or so students in our program uh, until the enrollments ran. Great, thank you. Uh, Bart asked sort of a follow-up question to that. He wanted to know what types of people you're hiring as coaches or what type you envision hiring in the future. And he mentioned advising professionals, faculty members, instructional designers, etc. I could really see it might be really interesting to have some of the people who are engaged in the development of the course and who are going to be involved in the ongoing improvement of the course uh, engaged in that kind of a role. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely. And you're, you're it's all of the above. Uh, we've defined the, um, the role, and then we really want to cast the net widely so that uh, there are some faculty who actually see this as a sort of uh, Google World uh, version of the, um, the tutors that used to exist uh, in higher education 100 years ago and still kind of exist in Oxford and Cambridge. So, um, so you've got all the way from that to uh, traditional advisors who are interested in this role. And, and then you're right, instructional designers um, and other, uh, other student service professionals. I'll go ahead and uh, jump in with a question if, if nobody else wants to right now. Or uh, Pat, do you have any questions too? But one of the things I'm wondering is, so Michael Horn and others have, you know, and Clay Christensen, when they talk about disrupting and when you bring them in to talk about where universities might want to consider moving, they often say you really need to sort of start a skunk works that can operate outside the university structure and you know create take some creative, energized people and free them from some of the constraints that exist. I see when I see what you're doing and what uh, University of Northern Arizona and some other places, it seems like maybe extension or outreach is sort of the uh, the home for these skunk works that, that have a little more freedom, perhaps. You want to comment on that? Yeah, you are absolutely right. In fact, um, the the language I'm using now to describe extension, and uh, let me again say, uh, extension in Wisconsin is a bit different structure than it is on many campuses. Um, extension is its own institution with a chancellor, with a provost, with faculty and staff, etc. Whereas continuing studies or extension or continuing ed or whatever are very often part of the flagship campus on a, on a, in a university system. So we're our own thing. And it functions, I, I, but the language I've been using is extension is the entrepreneurial arm of the system. Uh, we can do things partnered with Milwaukee, for example, that UW-Milwaukee can't do on its own, uh, like offer this kind of program. If you think about any one campus having to develop their own student information system that would be competency-based versus the standard curricular uh, credit semester-based, it would be so expensive, it would be prohibitive. But if we can do this centrally and provide that service for each of the institutions who are providing the academic content and oversight, that's how we make this work. So I think you're right. There's something about um, the uh, part of an institution that works very much like a skunk, skunk works operation uh, that is really beneficial here. Now, you know, skunk works came out of, what was it, West General Electric or something like that, where they literally, they were in another building and they didn't have the same rules applied to them and they, you know, whatever. We're still in the system and so there's still a lot of the constraints that, um, that are similar to the other campuses. However, because we're kind of uh, weird in different ways, you know, we don't have real classes, we don't offer our own degrees, 
we're a little bit under the radar, and so we can do some things. Great, uh, great, thank you. I, I um, you also mentioned partnerships, and I'm wondering, uh, and that how what a big job it is to develop your own competency-based system. I know Pearson and others are working on competency-based systems. Do you, did you reach out and use any corporate partners or vendors to provide pieces of things that they'd already built? Or are you are you growing your own from the beginning? Yeah, we're growing our own. So part of the important uh, distinctive feature of our programs are that these are our, um, when a student finishes a, the nursing program at Milwaukee, they'll get the nursing degree without an asterisk, right? It's the exact same degree based on the same learning outcomes, and many of the assessments are similar, though not all of them. But same faculty, same faculty oversight and governance, same academic planning structures governed by the, the institution, et cetera. So um, the vendors have been all over us because they are recognizing the, um, the market in these sort of new kind of approaches. I, I'm sure you are, you know, you talk to Pearson and others every day. Um, so, uh, but, but actually, you know, it's you, a faculty might decide that they want to do that. So, for example, the math department at UW Colleges, which is offering these uh, gen ed math courses, they're using Alex. And you, you may know that Alex is a, you know, a, a vendor product. I think it's actually McGraw Hill, um, maybe Pearson. Anyway, it's one of the, it's, it, it is a vendor product, but that was a faculty-based decision. That wasn't, let's do this because of Flex. This was um, what they're doing anyway with their math courses. And anyway, so, so uh, we're not ruling out vendors, but um, it's not the, it's, um, it's really important for us that we have the, the regular faculty who are providing all the same um, oversight and Remind Kate, Kate, you. take it away. Go ahead, Kate. Oh, you're going to need to turn your mic on. And remind me to talk about the role of MOOCs. I'll get back to it, but in the context of uh, vendors and curated content and stuff like that. Will do. Kate, did you find your little icon? Nope. Not yet. There you go. Go ahead. Um, so, hi, uh, I am Kate and I work in the Associate um, Dean's Office for uh, Undergraduate and Graduate Education in the Liberal Arts. And so, um, I was curious if, um, if you could speak to the, the strategic goal behind the Associate's Degree, if, was it to shorten the time cost of degree, to um, drive enrollment to four year degree programs, um, and then how the design of that might be different than for some of the more professional programs in terms of the competency for the world. Okay, so I, uh, you were cutting out a little bit, so let me answer what I think I heard and then let me know if I didn't answer anything. Okay, so I think you, so one question you asked was um, some of the uh, motivation, or how would a student experience be different so it's different than a four year degree, you know, how might that work? What I'm curious about is, um, from a strategic side, what were you thinking about when creating that associate degree? Was it to, um, oh, to drive enrollment towards like a bachelor's, um, that those kind of things, but then also how that the design of the competency was um, as compared to the other more professional Okay, good. Okay, so um, the target market was uh, returning adult students who have some college and not a, not a degree. So it was aimed at um, trying to help, and in, in Wisconsin, the estimate is about 20% of the population is of that type. Um, and, um, and they're older students, they've got families, they, they're working, you know, and they don't arguably fit well into taking semester by semester courses, even if they're online, right? So part of the motivation was, could we create something for this new market uh, that fits into their life rather than trying to um, 
fit them into a, a semester system. Um, whether they finished faster or less in, in with, with lower cost, those were also important elements, but those weren't necessarily driving this. So for example, that 2250 uh, for a three month period was based on the costs of the program, not how do we price this cheaply. In fact, we had to be very cognizant of not cannibalizing our own programs. So um, how do we price this so that it's different from, but not so ridiculously cheap that why would you go to the standard um, uh, nursing program? So if you multiply 2250 times three, which is a nine month you know, standard academic year, it's approximately equal to the average tuition across, uh, undergraduate tuition across the system school. I do think the biggest savings for students is gonna be time. So that, um, like I gave that nurses, nursing, you know, RN example in nursing, um, a student might get through, I don't know, 25% of the competencies very quickly because they know this stuff and they can show it. And then they spend their time on other areas. And so instead of taking two years for a degree completion, RN to BSN, they may take a year and a half or they may take even shorter. So that that will be a, you know, that could be a significant cost saving. I think you asked also the question of uh, how uh, kind of the, the, um, the process of designing the curriculum and the competencies. So, um, my background is in um, in the kind of student learning outcomes. I'm very wedded to the backward design model. So you start without, even for a regular curriculum, you start with outcome, learning outcomes, then you go to assessments, then you go to the academic activities that lead to the best assessments, that lead to the best outcomes. So that process was actually uh, similar in some ways. And the, faculty, the discussions with faculty were pretty fun. Um, Let's, what do you want from these students? What do you want them to look like by the time they finish, right? And, and then how are you going to know what they know? And, uh, you know, it, it led to a lot of really interesting discussions. Um, you, you work with faculty, so you know, you know, they love this stuff. So, you know, those were really fun discussions. The kind of support we needed to provide, the instructional designers and some of the technical help was, okay, you've got this idea of an assessment and it's a really good idea, now how do we codify the uh, judgments that have to be made? And then if we're gonna load it into D2L or some other kind of uh, learning management system, how do we uh, massage what needs to be there in order to make it work? So we provided a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, instructional design help to, um, to, uh, to make stuff work. I have just a little a follow up to that. Um, with um, I imagine some of the broader, more liberal arts skills, was there sort of uh, disagreement on whose domain that was, like who the evaluators for the competencies would be? So something like, you know, excellence in communication is probably much more um, ambiguous than some other skills or competencies. So, to that. so um, yes. Uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, the, um, the, uh, the interesting discussions were, uh, you know, the nurses, this was true for them, but it was also true across the UW colleges when they're talking about gen ed in general, um, actually talking to each other about what, not just what are the course goals that I have, but what are the curricular goals. And then you're right, who's the best person to judge those things. So I remember actually in one meeting, one faculty uh, uh, development workshop, uh, they were talking about um, evolution. And the biologist who teaches evolution in their biology class was talking to the anthropologist who teaches about evolution in the anthropology class. And, you know, it was like uh, really interesting because in real time, in other words, they both were literally standing up in this big room talking to each other about what they do in their classes realizing that a third of it was almost word for word the same. 
and then two thirds of it were different related to kind of uh, cellular cellular level of biology evolution versus kind of uh, social level uh, evolution issues. But it was really fun and interesting. Now, as a principal, who does the assessments? In our program, it's the faculty. So the nurses at Milwaukee are in charge of doing the assessments. Or they'll relegate it to TAs or others, but they'll still have the same faculty of record oversight that um, is true for any department. And that's, again, an important element of ours. We don't want to hire in special evaluators who are outside of the um, faculty ranks or, or outside of those departments who are who are doing evaluation because in this competency-based model, the evaluation and the assessments are where a lot of the learning is, right? Um, whether you pass and you get feedback on how you did or whether, you, particularly if you don't pass and you get feedback on what you need to do, you know, that, that's really the, the, the meat of the educational experience. Thanks. All right, Pat has a question. Pat Show. Hi, Aaron. So I'm the um, prior learning assessment uh, coordinator here at Penn State. And as you began to explain the competency uh, assessments for the degree, um, it sounds exactly like what we do here in prior learning assessment. So they already have, let's say, the medical terminology. Why should they have to sit through a class? So we do an assessment, credit by exam, credit by portfolio and they get credit and they can move on. Of course, we're talking about our course-based system and our degrees. So my question for you is, for example, with the nursing degree, then do I have to have a medical background and prior knowledge to enter this flex degree so that I'm able to um, be assessed um, quicker in the beginning? So, so I have to have this medical background, or I have to have been an RN, and I'm going for BSN. Or, so if I'm if I don't have that, then do I have to go over and take the traditional route for this? Right. So the particular version, the flex version of the RN to BSN program, does require that someone comes in with an RN. Okay. But the bachelor's of information science and technology does not. So that's a start to finish four year quote, four-year degree. Um, but let's take your example of the nurses who come in with an RN degree. Um, the uh, the uh, ability for a student to demonstrate their mastery of medical terminology is solely dependent on their um, passing the, the mastery exam. So whether they were an RN for one year, or they just got their degree just you know a month ago, or they've been in, in practice for ten years, is irrelevant for us. Um, and you know, again, this program is built on requiring students having an RN. But imagine a student who didn't have an RN, but watched every episode of, of House and knew medical terminology left and right. Theoretically, they could complete that medical terminology degree, uh, sorry, uh, competency, and then move on to the next thing. And then, you know, that actually raises the bar for the faculty to say if someone actually wasn't an RN but knew this stuff, is that okay in this one domain of medical terminology? And, you know, so they're, they're struggling with those, those uh, questions. So you also talked about the role of faculty is different. So um, if I don't know those things, who teaches me? You're, you're, you're given an assessment to measure a competency. We presume that I can meet. But what if I can't? Who's teaching me what I need to learn in these, this degree format? Right. So, uh, so the teaching model is very much the SAGE on, not the sage on the stage, but the guide on the side model. So the first round there is the academic success coach. Oh, you took that medical terminology test. How did it go? Oh, it looks like you got a 74, not an 86. Um, the faculty will have identified materials already to help students uh, with, uh, with that information. It won't be teaching. It still is like, go watch this video. 
this is where I wanted to talk about MOOCs. It might be that there's a MOOC to participate in, which by the way, the reason I like your flex MOOC idea is um, I think MOOCs are, are more or less the textbooks in the Google world. You know, you can sample them what you need to rather than do the thing start to finish. But anyway, so there's curated material and there will also be content that faculty may um, develop themselves because there isn't uh, existing materials out there. Now, if a student really needs more than that, more than just here's the materials, work through it, and then try this assessment again, um, they may be referred to an actual class. And then, if so, that's not part of the, the uh, flex degree. That's take a class as a special student and, um, and then ready yourself for the, for the uh, assessment that way. So the instructors are providing, they're overseeing the curriculum, they're doing assessment. They may provide some tutoring, but there is not the expectation that you're structuring a, a classroom activities in the way that we think of uh, faculty instruction now. Thank you. Oop. So um, you've talked about competencies and you know, clusters of competencies, and it seems like digital badging would be a natural, but you haven't used the term badging. I, I assume you guys are avoiding that for a reason, uh, but maybe not. So what are your thoughts on digital badges and the, the badging kind of movement that's out there? So in principle, it's the same as these stackable certificates, I think. Um, in, in different ways, they're different, but that's the intent. So no, it's not, we're not anti-badge, it's just um, we're using different terminology that's more, we think of as more uh, uh, mainstream in an academic world. So people know what certificates are, minors and things like that. Badges calm up the imagery of um, Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. And stuff. But it's the same concept, it really is. And, you know, people um, knock badges or certificates because they think of them as, as um, trivial. Um, rather than, you know, significant. But you could have a, a badge or a certificate in critical thinking. You just have to define it well. So uh, anyway, so yeah, it's, it is compatible with that approach. Yeah, I, I agree. It's really micro-certification, and that's what you're doing you're by creating your little certificate. So I, I, I believe that I, I agree with you on that. Um, another thing, though, is I'd, I'd heard earlier about University of Wisconsin saying they were going to have a, a I'm going to use the term PLA or a test out option for all of their courses across the university. Is that was that right? Or am I did I misunderstand that? And how does that fit in with this? And is it making progress? And yeah. what can you tell us about that? So um, so we got a grant. This is several years ago from Lumina Foundation about PLA and. Um, the intent wasn't to create uh, unified um, test out procedures across the board, but it was to try and push this as much as we could. So, you know, could you uh, develop uh, the PLA, PLA portfolio review and other kinds of processes um, uh, in ways that made good sense? And so, uh, actually, in that program, they learned a lot of interesting things about how how much effort is involved in creating the PLA both portfolios for the students and also the assessments on, uh, on, the, um, on the assessment side which we have borrowed from uh, one of the leads on that grant is consulting with us on this project so they kind of fit together um, but there's been separate projects Oh, your mute, your mute is on. Thank you. So uh, another question that I sort of saved for a, a later moment was Doug Wilson asked, are you open to grad student research projects? I would love to have grad student research projects. In fact, of the, all the things I miss in my formal life is not having grad students that I can talk to about all the research going on. There is a ton of really interesting stuff that could be done about, uh, about our program. Absolutely. Great. Well, we so another thing that Coil. So you read a little bit about Coil, our Center for Online Innovation and Learning. 
Well, we're looking for partner organizations too that are doing creative things where we can partner on research around uh, thing X, Y, and Z. So uh, I would appreciate your willingness to collaborate. And if you have research questions you'd like looked at, feel free to contact us. One of the things we do is sort of broker with a large graduate student uh, population that's really rallying around. We're trying to really create momentum in the area of online learning innovations. And uh, we certainly see you as one of the pioneers out there. We're happy to help and get involved in ways we can. I know you have your own fine graduate schools too, and they might be a little jealous if we swoop in and uh, help them research your innovation. But uh, if you need more you more need more. help, let us know. Yeah. More and we'll let... Okay. And Doug, I, I think you just got a green light to propose something, Doug. So that sounds good. All right. Any other questions? We've kept uh, we've kept Aaron for about the hour that he promised, uh, and uh, a little over. But uh, if anybody has a last question, we'll we'll entertain another question before we sign off. Oh, Doug says he already has something. I don't know if he has another question or if he already has an idea. Sounds like he probably already has an idea. That's great. Well, we can. I'm happy to talk, uh, so Doug and uh, Kyle. Feel free to give my uh, contact information to whoever wants it. You can also find me on the web. So uh, happy. To right. Thank you very much. You've been you've been very gracious with your time. We know you're a very busy man, not just with that, but with all the duties of all the different roles you play. And uh, again, we really appreciate your willingness to uh, share your time with us and your expertise. And if we can return the favor sometime, please. Let us know. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. It was uh, great to talk to you all. Thanks for the invitation. Great. Right. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye.